Let's open up our scriptures to Deuteronomy chapter 6. You know, how cautious should we be in the things we say, in the things we do even think? How guarded should we be, especially when we speak and carry out the things of God? If there is one passage in the scriptures that brings the importance of being vigilant concerning the things of our Lord, it is this passage before us today. A passage that extends through the next six chapters, chapter 6 to 11 of Deuteronomy. After the historical review from chapter 1 to 4, and after the introduction of the law in chapter 5, where we see the Ten Commandments, six full chapters are given to us as a preparation for the details of the law. Six full chapters of admonition where Pastor Moses beautifully wins the past, the present, and the future so that the Israelites then and the readers today may prepare their hearts to receive and keep the word of God in their hearts. So this is a very practical uh, passage in Deuteronomy we're going to see today. Many times that after being in a situation for a while and away from the scriptures, our minds often wanders off and we end up surrounding ourselves with walls of elaborate concepts and speculation that alienates us from the reality of this world. And we begin to believe and live in an other world, away from the precepts of God. I want to tell you, if you want to have a good perspective of this world, where we're heading to, and where we are, where we were, it is in the scriptures that you're going to find all these things. Now let me give you a sense of Moses' insistence and urgency here. See Deuteronomy 6.3. He says, Therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe that it may be well with you. The word careful is the translation of the Hebrew word shema. To hear, to listen, this word is repeated at least seven times in this chapter. And speaking of the word of God as the guardian of our souls, he says in verse 6, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Look at 8 and 9. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. I don't think he could have brought the importance of the word of God more forcefully as he does here and he adds in verse 12 then beware he says lest you forget the lord lest you forget the word of the lord beware is the word listen again shema we are so prone to forget and furthermore 10 times we read of the words you shall this is a one letter in the Hebrew, ve, that marks a conjunction. And its repetition alerts us of the seriousness of the word spoken. And speaking of God, we read in verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, it says. Speaking of the word, see the following verses. You can just listen as I'm going to give them to you. We, we read in verse 7. You shall teach them diligently. Verse 8, you shall bind them as a sign. Verse 9, you shall write them on the doorpost. Verse 13, you shall fear the Lord your God. 14, you shall not go after other gods. 16, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. He wanted to prepare the Jewish people to keep the word of God so they will not fall. And this is not all. Back to the law and the word of God. We read in verse 17. You shall diligently keep the commandment of the Lord. And the next verse, you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord. Moses wanted so much the Israelites to be successful in the land. And here he vents his concern with such passion. But he knew that at the end, the nation will not heed these admonitions. Sadly, history testifies of the outcome. But it should not have been this way. And it should not be this way for our lives either. In fact, as we're going to see later on, it is from this portion of Deuteronomy that Yeshua three times quoted this passage against the attack of the evil one, showing us that what is contained in these six chapters are like an elaboration of the armor of God one needs to put on every day, as Paul says in Ephesians 6, in order to withstand the vials of the evil one. So these passages are great ones. And they contain very practical application for everyday life. And there is something else very strong in this very chapter beyond the practical ap application found in there. It is that one chapter that speaks about the nature of God. The triune nature of God in a most beautiful way. 
Now let's begin by reading the first six verses of Deuteronomy 6. There is so much in there that meets the eye at first glance. Now after giving the Ten Commandments, Moses lays down that which Jesus speaks as being this is the first and great commandment. This commandment is found right in verse 5. Let's read verses 1 to 5. It says, Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded you to teach you that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and commandments which I command you and your son and your grandson all the days of your life, and that your day may be prolonged. Therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. You know, there's an important sequence from chapter 5 to 6 between the giving of the Ten Commandments and what we read here. The three first verses are basically, they say basically the same thing. Be careful to observe, to follow, to read, to listen what the Lord says in His Word. And in so doing, you shall know your God. You shall develop the fear of the Lord, it says in verse 2. And here lies the key of a stable and good life. And what does it mean, by the way, to fear the Lord? The word fear plays a double role here. That of dread and that of reverence. Dread because it is true that God is a consuming fire who will judge all our actions as one will dread his enemy. It is of reverence if one commits his life to his son, to him, and the fear becomes as one who fears his good father, who seeks the best for his child. And so it has two things in there. For those who committed their lives to the God of the Bible, the fear, the reverence, the knowledge of the Lord brings great blessings. The book of Proverbs, by the way, speaks very much about it. It says, the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. You want to have confidence in your life? Develop A knowledge of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the fountain of life. It begins there. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That is of deliverance. You know, there's a protection in the fear of the Lord. A protection against the terror of the wicked. If we fear the Lord, no other fears can touch you. It is a protective and comforting fear. By fearing the Lord, you will experience the life in its fullest. And this knowledge of the Lord will bring you to fulfill the first and greatest commandment of God. Verse 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, heart, soul, mind. That is the whole of yourself. These are three synonyms. And each one brings you to a higher and higher commitment and revelation of God as you go through your life here on earth. The heart and the soul expresses the totality of man's nature and character, the inner and the outer. They denote the intention of the will of the whole man. The might brings the idea of exceeding, that is very greatly, as if the Lord calls on us to absolutely fully give ourselves to Him. The whole idea here is that if the Lord absorbs all our affections, there will be no room for self or the world. No provision for the flesh, just like Paul says. And it is in this type of relationship that the Lord is asking from the Israelites and from all of us here present, and as the blessings of the Israelites dependent of their obedience on the Word of God, so is our happiness depends on what we do with what the Lord is giving us. But how can one possibly give his whole self to God if he does not know who God is, right? Right? This high demand that we find in verse 5, to love God with all your heart, your soul, and might, is preceded by one verse that gives us a deep insight in the nature of our God. It goes without saying that to properly worship God, we ought to know who God is. So as Deuteronomy 6.5 speaks of our commitment to God, the preceding verse, Deuteronomy 6.4, speaks of the nature of God, of an important, it reveals to us an important facet of the nature of God. Let's look at 6.4 again. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Where is the nature of God in this verse? 
First, this passage plays a very big part and is a most revered one in rabbinical Judaism since its creation 2,000 years ago. It has become to be known as the Shema. Shema means to listen, which is the first words of this verse. The Shema here in Deuteronomy 6.4 is considered the basic confession of faith in rabbinical Judaism and has come to be an affirmation of the declaration of faith in one God, monotheism. This verse is a safeguard against polytheism. Israel was surrounded by nations that worship many gods. And here, the Israelites are told again, as in the first three commandments, that God is one. God is exclusive. The verse became so entrenched in Judaism that Jews are commanded to say the Shema twice daily, in the morning and at night. In fact, the Shema is three passages, as you can see in the screen, Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9. 11, 13 to 21, and Numbers 15, 37 to 41. But this verse, I want to tell you, speaks volumes. On, on the one hand, it speaks of God's uniqueness, and within this uniqueness, it speaks of the nature of God. By the words used, it shows something very great. It shows not only the exclusivity of God, but also the plurality of His nature. The great irony here is that we believers in the Trinity, in the triune nature of God, are often quoted this verse to prove us wrong. But this verse really speaks of the plurality of the nature of the God of the Bible. Let's look at this passage again. There is one word we ought to see very closely. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. See the concluding word, one. It comes after that the name of the Lord is mentioned three times, but what is in this word, one? There are two main words in the Old Testament for one. The word echad and the word yachid. One word is echad. The main idea of this word is that of a compounded unity. It is a oneness of different parts of something. For instance... For the union of a husband and wife, in Genesis 2.24, God says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh, one echad. It is two put together to form one. This word is a compounded unity in the Hebrew. In Ezra 2.64, the whole assembly of Israel is seen as one. The first says, the whole assembly, echad, it says, was 42,360. So the use of this word echad in scripture shows it to be a compounded unity, not an absolute one. And this is the one that is used in Deuteronomy 6 for. What about the other word, yachid, which is used as an adverb? This one means one and only one. When God reaffirmed his covenant with Abraham, in Genesis 22, three times, he spoke of Isaac as being the one and only one son, Yahid, he said, with whom he will fulfill his promises. In Zechariah 12.10, God spoke of the Messiah as his only son. There are no other Jesus. Yahid, showing the exclusivity and only way to come through him. And this is not the word that is used in the Shema, in Deuteronomy 6, 4, the question now is, why has not the Spirit of God used Yahid in Deuteronomy 6, 4 instead of Echad? The reason why is not that difficult to see. It is written throughout the whole of the scriptures. It is because of the tri- triune nature of the God of the Bible. To those who do not believe, it is foolishness, but to us, this shows the power of God. And this is not just falling from the sky in Deuteronomy. We have seen God's physical manifestation before. Manifestation that surprised even those who experienced it. Remember in Genesis 32-30. One among many passages. Here Jacob said, For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Who did he see? Someone he called God. In fact, he was surprised to be alive. After seeing God, as it says in Exodus 33, 20, when God says, no one can see me. If you see my face, you shall die. So Jacob knew that. 
And the question that needs to be answered, who did Jacob see? And just a few verses before, in our section today, in Deuteronomy 4.33, Moses brings this back. Here the Israelites, as Jacob, knew that no man could approach God. There Moses reminded them that they were very close to him. He said, did ever a people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of fire, as you have heard, and live? It is not only seeing, but also hearing directly that a man cannot survive if they hear God. Who came to them? It is the Messiah. This is a theophany, a physical appearance of God that we see so many times in the scriptures. And I want to tell you that even in rabbinical Judaism, some rabbis have seen and understood something about the strength of the meaning that we find in Deuteronomy 6.4. If there is something that is very baffling within the Zohar, the Zohar is a collection of rabbinical writings and mystical commentary on the Torah that is of the first five books of Moses. By the way, this book first appeared in the 13th century in Spain. And there in its commentary on Deuteronomy 6.4, it went very far in saying something quite extraordinary, something we should use for evangelism. If you did not know it was the Zohar, you'd think that it was a Messianic Jew that wrote this. Let me tell you what it says about Deuteronomy 6.4. There are two, and one is joined to them, making three. And when there are three, they are one. He said to them, these are the two names of God, Jehovah in the Shema, our God, as it, as it were, the signature. And when they are joined, they form one. How did they see this? From the word. From what the word means. These people seem to have understand the strength of the word Echad here. The compounded nature of God. Again in the Zohar. It says, these three are one. How can the three names be one, they ask. Only through the perception of the faith in the vision of the Holy Spirit in the beholding of the eyes, hidden eyes alone. They got this right, by the way. You know, these writers did not see the Trinity. They were not Messianic Jews. But what that tells us is that the Hebrew is written in such a, such a way as to bring the reader to see the plurality of the oneness of God. They saw the trace of the triune God without believing in the Trinity. These unwittingly have touched on something very precious. I don't know how far they went, but it is my prayer that if someone in the rabbinical world studies this passage, he will be brought to consider the very nature of the Messiah to whom Deuteronomy 6.4 speaks of and be brought to a saving knowledge of the Messiah of Israel who is none else than Yeshua of Nazareth. The child that Isaiah himself calls the everlasting father in Isaiah 9.6. This child that is called mighty God in the same passage and also Everlasting Father who is going forth from eternity in Micah 5. It is this person that Jacob saw. And I said, he said, I've seen God face to face and I didn't die. And there's something else I found baffling in secular and rabbinical Judaism. You know, when they speak of God, they speak of the unity of God or the divine unity. For instance, in the Midrash Rabbah, another collection of rabbinical writing on lamentation, it says... And twice daily I proclaim his unity, they say. Saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Even Encyclopedia Judaica defines the Shema. It says the twice daily recitation of the declaration of God's unity. Let me ask you a question. Can one speak of one as a unity? By definition, a unity is a combining or joining of separate things to form one. A unity is composed or two or more one, as the word Echad conveys. How can they speak of God as a unity if they say that he is one and only one? Have they understood something unwittingly? It is again my prayer that these people, that these people of God will come to realize the very words they use to describe their own God in the Bible so that they may see who he is and so they may be led to see who Yeshua is. And there's another irony here, right? In that these people without the revelation of the New Testament have seen something in the plurality of the nature of God. Yet today, 
people with the New Testament that doubt actually the divinity of our Messiah Yeshua. And the reality is that if one does not allow the plurality of the nature of God, this one will eventually be forced out of the scriptures. Because the Bible, the Old and New Testament speaks over and over of the triune nature of God. And furthermore, if one stays within the teaching of the scriptures, this one will eventually come to realize that the Messiah is divine. That Jesus is the Messiah and that the New Testament is the natural continuation of what was started in the Tanakh. Let me give you some hands-on on the unity we find in the word Echad. Who is the creator of the universe, by the way? God. Genesis 1.1, the Father, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Hold on. Colossians 1.16, it says that it is the Son, for by Him all things were created. Psalm 104.30, it says that the Spirit of God did it. You sent forth your Spirit and they are created. Why? Because they are Echad. They are one, a compounded one. Another thing, who rose Jesus from the dead? The Father. God has raised him from the dead, it says in Romans 10.9. It is the Spirit. Hold on. It says in Romans 8.11, but the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead. It is himself, Yeshua, in John 10.18. He says, I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it again. Our salvation was done by each and all the members of the Trinity, by the Echad, of the God of the Bible. And there's something else in this verse. The word God, did you know? I mean, not if you ever realized that the word God is plural. Elohim. Right? Gods. This is what it says. Here are Israel, the Lord Jehovah, the gods, the Lord Jehovah is one. First, let me tell you that this word Elohim is used 2,249 times in the Tanakh, and often with a singular article, Ha Elohim, the God, to differentiate, of course, from the false gods. A singular article for a plural name. Here again, we can see the plurality of the divine nature. Many have tried to explain away this plural in the word, God. Some say it is the plural of majesty, just like we have in French and in English, right? But the plural of majesty came way after the biblical writings. The kings of the Bible, for instance, whenever addressed in the plural. Others say that the plural expresses an abstract idea. So that Elohim will really mean the divinity. You know how convenient it is to bring in abstract ideas when we don't understand or we don't want to accept what is written. Others, even bolder, said that this usage came from the Canaanites who were polytheists. And the Israelites copy them as if the Bible was inspired by the Canaanites. It is the word of God. He inspired every single word in there. And it's not only the article that is singular. It is the verb that is attached to it that is singular. Plural, singular, verb. This fact should bring anyone interested in the God of the Bible to see and to dig deeper to discover his nature so that we may properly worship him and be blessed by him. And this is why I believe that the passage of Deuteronomy 6.4 precedes the one speaking of our relationship with him. You need to know who God is in order for him to bless you, in order for you to have a relationship with you. Look at again verse 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. There's a connection here. What it says is that know your gods, and then you shall properly worship him. You know that verse 5 will lose all its power if you do not know who God is. One more thing before we leave this section. One difficult concept you will find in the Bible is that of the Trinity, right? We'll have that difficulties in understanding what it is. You've surely heard the argument that the term Trinity is not in the Bible, so it's wrong. As if the absence of a word in the Bible makes that word and the concept behind it completely void. As if all the words of the vocabulary are in the Bible. But why this word is not there, I want to tell you that the concept is surely there. And not only there, it's all over the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. Approaching the concept of Trinity is like Ezekiel. Do you remember Ezekiel in chapter 1? 
when he was brought up to heaven and sees extraordinary things but could only describe them with human words. And so we have the same predicament when he comes to speak about the nature of God. How can we possibly understand that? Basically what the Trinity says is that there's one God, one divine nature, one being. This is the starting point that is the base where are monotheists. Second, this divine being is tripersonal, involving the distinction of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And third, that these three are in the same nature and majesty of God. You know, as someone said, the Trinity is a mystery which my faith embraces and has revealed that is in the Word, but my reason cannot fathom. It was reported of a preacher who had difficulties explaining the Trinity to his congregation. And so he promised his audience to come back next week with a clearer definition and to make plain the mystery of the Trinity. He took a big chance, by the way. And while he was studying it, he went by the seaside and he saw a boy very busy with a little spoon coming and going between the sea, the water of the sea, to the small hole he had dug into the ground. The preacher asked him, what are you doing? So the boy answered, I'm going to bring all the sea into the hole that I just dug. There he understood that he could never really understand the immense concept of the Trinity. He understood that he could not fully understand it, but he knew about it. By the way, this is a grace from God. It is a grace from God that we know about it, that we know it exists, just like we know of the past, present and future just like we know of eternity he gives us these little things for us to know and from this point in Deuteronomy 6 5 until the end of the chapter Moses admonishes the Israelites to never forget these words so strong it is that from this passage two rituals were adopted in rabbinical Judaism they understood this passage the first one is in verse 8 when he said, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. From there, the tefillims, or the phylacteries, as we call them in English, were thought out. These things, the religious people wear six days a week, except the Shabbat, every morning. You know, we have to commend them for doing this. At least they have that zeal, that zeal that Paul speaks about. The tefillims are two black leather boxes containing scriptural passages which are bound by black leather straps on the left and on, that is on the left hand and on the head. This contains four passages of the Bible in which Deuteronomy 6, 4, Exodus 13, 1 to 10, 11 to 16, and Deuteronomy 11, 13 to 21. You have a picture of how they wear it and they do it every single day. The other ritual is taken from the following passage, verse 9. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Have you noticed that Jewish people have a mezuzah on their door? This is what the mezuzah, the meaning of mezuzah, by the way, in Hebrew is doorpost. This is a box most Jews will put on in the upper right side of their door to show their faith. The mezuzah consists of a piece of parchment made from the skin of a clean animal, upon which two passages were written, Deuteronomy 6, 4-9, 11, 13 to 21. This parchment is rolled up and inserted in a case with a small uh, aperture. And uh, on the back of the parchment, the word Chadai, that is Almighty, is shown. So every time they come into their house, they remember God. They remember the name of God. You know, the earliest evidence of the mezuzah and the phylacteries dates from the second temple period, and I believe that Yeshua, Jesus, must have had a mezuzah fixed at his doorpost of his dwelling. Him being a carpenter must have been very familiar with this. And the remaining of the chapters here in Deuteronomy, Moses brings them, brings the Israelites to remember how the Lord delivered them from Egypt and the many wonderful signs God performed in front of their eyes. This is, that speaks to us. Let's not forget what the Lord has done for us. Just our salvation is dayenu, is enough. Look at verse 23 to 25. Speaking to them and to us. It says, Then he brought us 
out from there that he might bring us in to give us the land of which he swore to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, the fear of the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. Then it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all these commandments before the Lord our God as he has commanded. The righteousness for us, it would be righteousness for us if we keep the word of God. The righteousness for us, Moses says, is to abide by the word of God and to never forget what God has done for you. Remember the promises. You know, I read a story. I really hope it is not true and that it never happened. But I want to tell it to you because it does relate to our relationship with God and how important it is to remember Him. You know, after stopping for gas in Montgomery, Alabama, a man called Sam drove more than five hours before noticing that he had left something behind, someone behind. He left his wife. So at the next town, he asked the police to help him get in touch with his wife. Then Sam called his wife to tell her he was on his way back. He admitted with great embarrassment that he just hadn't noticed her absence with him. You know, how could Sam forget his wife? Silly, isn't it not? But wait, we're not much different in our relationship with God. We often fail to remember the one who created us and the one who redeemed us. And this is why Moses here constantly reminds us to remember, he tells us to remember what God has done for us. And it is here in Deuteronomy 6. When you look at the whole chapter, it tells us how never to forget. Let me lay down the whole chapter for you. First, in verse 4 to 5, God is telling us, Know the real issues of life and keep your priority straight. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love your, the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Second, take the scriptures seriously. Become so familiar with them that they are a part of what you think and what you feel and what you do. And these words, he says, which I command you in verse 6, today shall be in your heart. Third, talk about God to your children and look for the opportunity to tell them of his love. You shall teach them diligently to your children, it says. Fourth, write reminders to yourself and put them where they can easily be seen. Okay? Look at verse 8 and 9. You shall bind them as a sign in your hand, in your forehead, in your doorpost, everywhere. Bring God with you. And fifth, realize that your need for God is not limited to times of obvious stra stress and danger. Enjoy with gratitude whatever health and happiness you have. Verse 10 and 11, so it shall be when the Lord your God brings you to your land, into the land of which he swore to your father, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities, which you did not build, houses full of good things, he says, which you did not fill, and so on and so forth. Enjoy it when the Lord blesses you. And thank him. Can we put God out of our mind? Yes, I'm afraid we can. That is why we must acknowledge him and obey him continually. And there's a warning that the Israelites are given in verse 16, one that is significant, and it is this very verse that Jesus quoted against the evil one. Verse 16, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And then he adds, as you tempted him in Massa. What happened in Massa? You know, Massa means proof. Back in the wilderness, because the voyage was hard, the people became increasingly tired and their patience was running out. They were thirsty, especially. So tired they were, even the pillar of God that was constantly with them was no more visible for them. It was there, they didn't see it anymore. Their discouragement blinded them for his presence. In the same way that when we are weighed down, when we are weary, we do not see the presence of God in our lives. And if we let go of God's presence, this passage tells us that things will tend to get worse. And notice that back at the water of Massa, I want to bring you there. Actually, it's in Exodus chapter 17. Back in the water of Massa, what is beautiful in there is how God deals 
with this problem that they had. Just want to read you verses 5 to 7. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the, ro the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, so he called the name of the place, place Massa and Meribah, because of the contention of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So the Lord instructed him, instructed Moses to take his rod and to strike the rock. And water came out because the people were thirsty. But what kind of water came out? Yes, it was water they could drink. But there's something else that this water represents, right? There's a beautiful here picture of the Messiah. To quench their thirst, God brought water out of a dry rock. And later, the Spirit of God inspired Paul to plainly tell us in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, that this rock... Typify the Messiah, right? And all drank the same spiritual drink, it says, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Our thirst, our complete need, can only be fulfilled if we go to the Messiah. Speaking of himself, Jesus says in John 4, 14, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. What a promise we have here. And this is exactly what Moses was pointing to in those verses following the mention of Massa. You shall diligently keep his commandment as Jesus is the word himself. And his words are in our Bible from where the waters of healing comes out. You know, to conclude, how can we apply all these things in our lives? How can we live by the Word of God? You know, we read of a wealthy man who purchased a high cost, at high cost, that is a famous painting of Jesus. He sought with difficulties an appropriate place for it on the walls of his own home. He tried everywhere. And at last he called an architect who, after carefully examining the house and the picture, he says, man, you cannot fit this picture into your home. You have to make a new home for, you, for this picture. Just as surely we must so order our home life that it would be appropriate to invite Jesus to abide therein. Can we invite Jesus in our home now? We have to remake our home. We have to clean it. We have to take out all dust, all things that would offend him. We need to change. We don't need, we cannot change God to fit our lives. But our lives need to be changed in order for him to come to us. And one last verse that I would bring to you, and this one are for those families with children. Verse 7 of the Deuteronomy 6, as it speaks of teaching the word of God to your children. See what it says. You shall teach them diligently to your children and you shall talk to them when you sit in your home and when you walk in the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. There's so much stress on the home, right? Your home is the number one influence in the life of your child. The average congregation or church has a child 1% of his time. The school has him only 16% of his time. But you have him 83% of the time. Children learn best when parents convey the scriptures naturally and frequently. When you sit, when you walk, when you allow, speaks about the word of God. Many today say that we ought to leave our children, make up their own decisions about their God and the Bible. I heard of two men who had a discussion about this matter. One of them invited the other into his somewhat neglected garden. Do you call this a garden? The visitor ex exclaimed. There are nothing but weeds there. The other answered, well, you see, I did not wish to infringe upon the liberty of the garden in any way. I was just giving the garden a chance to express itself. You know, teaching our children about the word of the God is the best gift you can give your a young soul. Let's bow our head in prayer. Almighty God, may our hearts join the angelic song today, crying hallelujah, just like we did before, Lord. May we gladly submit to your rule in our own lives. 
May we be obedient to your word so that we may serve as we must. And I take this time, Lord, to bring to your throne all our workers today, those who are obedient to you, those who teach the children, those that set up the kitchen downstairs, those that sing and bring us to worship you, those that set up the sound system, those that translate, those that pray, and the many others who have a willing heart. Bless them, Lord. Bless their obedience to you and make us willing workers, generous givers, and selfless servant of Yeshua. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you all.